Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We're very pleased and happy to have for us with us today Professor Bert O'Malley, who is currently the chairperson of the Department of Otorhinolaryngology. Okay. Are we okay with that? Yes. Great. So this I would call this from concept to clinical reality and reality. It's actually two surgeons' odyssey um, over the past many years. And I want to acknowledge my partner in this, Dr. Greg Weinstein, and he'll come up throughout the talk. Um, so sorry you're eating, but this is, this is our life in head and neck cancer. And this is not done intentionally because you're eating, but this is what we do or have done classically head and neck uh, surgery. This is classic open radical surgery for cancers of the tongue, back of the throat, head and neck region. We use massive cuts on the face. We have to break the jawbone in half to get back to remove tumors in the back of the tongue and throat area. We have to place feeding tubes in someone's stomach because of this so that they can eat through the course of their treatment. We have to pr place breathing tubes in their neck called tracheostomy tubes so that they can breathe through the course of the, the treatment. Typical, typical operations are 12 to 14 hours, 7 to 10 days in the hospital, and there's severe speech and swallowing dysfunction, as well as cosmetic deformity and emotional turmoil. So this is destructive surgery, unfortunately, with a very destructive dis disease. Is that dysfunction sustained, or is it during the course of the hospital? It, it's an immediate, uh, Jim, and then it is sustained to some point uh, over the course of your lifetime. And then you add, if you add uh, treatments such as radiation on top of this, which typically they get, it's a lifelong, you know, just uh, even slowly progressively destructive process in terms of swallowing function I'm and quality of life. Is that a mustache under his nose? That is a mustache under his and nose. And how come you don't shave that when well, you surgery? That's a good question. One, we, we, we put some betadine on, and, but the head neck is not a sterile environment. Our old okay, cavities, throat, right. neck aren't sterile. So all we right. clean it up, but, but by nature it's not sterile. So. The successful results. These are some examples. This wasn't necessarily, he wasn't done here, and I use that as it was published in Esquire, so it's a public <coughs> document, to show this was considered an excess, successful result. These are what the people look like. This lady can't eat well. She has a tube in her neck, as you know, with uh, Roger Ebert, you know, barely coming out because of the deformity that, went, that he went through and the, and the dysfunction and the whole emotional turmoil that goes on when you have these terrible things done to you for the sake of curing your cancer in the head and neck region. So this was classically successful results. So because of these destructive surgeries, uh, we looked, and it wasn't me at the time, this was before my time, but about 30 years ago they started looking at the options of non-surgical intervention using chemotherapy and radiation instead of surgery. Um, unfortunately, in order to get the equivalent or even come close to getting equivalent uh, oncologic outcomes, cures, and survival, they've had to push the surgery and chemotherapy to extreme levels. So what we have now is a choice of either radical surgery or radical chemotherapy and radiation. The non-surgical treatment now is almost as bad and many will say it's worse. Of my patients, 99% say the, that the chemotherapy and radiation is worse than anything that we could have done to them surgically or did to them surgically, including what you saw before. So we're, we've now approached a non-surgical radical therapy. And these people get six weeks of intense chemotherapy and radiation. They, can, they have permanent feeding tubes in their stomach to eat. That means they can't eat at all or enough to not have a feeding tube, 8 to 35% of patients. So there's severe dysfunction right now with the radical non-surgical approach. So and there's a lot of late-term complications of chemotherapy, loss of taste smell problems, stiffening the neck, muscles, throat, it, it starts really even re recurring again in problems after about 10 years. Excuse me, uh, is this necessary because the tumor has been there for a long time and has not been diagnosed, or um, can this be necessary when the first appearance of any well, the problem with his first appearance is finding it. This is, you know, back in the back of the throat, so you don't see that every day. Um, the dentist typically find these, but only if they're bigger, because they can sit back in an area that no one could see. No doctor, no dentist in the back of the tongue, that deep into the throat that's not <coughs> visible. So a typical complaint is sore throat. Well, everyone has sore throats, colds, acid reflux, you know, other problems that go on. And so sore throat may be the only t thing that goes on until you show up with a lump in your neck. And now you have advanced cancer because it's spread. Uh, you know, examples, Michael Douglas, who recently underwent this uh, chemotherapy and radiation for a advanced cancer, not so big primary site, but because of the node in his neck, so they report. So, do we need, yes, we do need something better. 
So the question is, is there a role for minimally invasive robotic surgery? Um, there's, there's been a trend with the robot, very expensive technology. The goal is to use the robot with tiny little arms at the end, little hands that can climb into small holes and do surgery less invasively. So, but questions come up. Is it too expensive? This is a $2.5 million robot, not covered by insurance. And then the technology around it, telescopes and screens and monitors and other disposable instruments. Is it too cumbersome to be a practical use in our specialty of head and neck was an early question that came up. And people say, well, why don't we use classic technology? Why isn't it good enough? Microscopes or little telescopes you put on your eyes called loops? That should be enough to get back there and do that, or it's, it, it will suffice. So I bring this up in September 2004. There was a meeting. It's our annual meeting of head and neck surgeons, otolaryngologists, called the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. And there was a symposium on robotic surgery. And we had colleagues there who were early researchers and looking at robotics that had the robot early on, both at Stanford and Hopkins, very bright, talented colleagues, who after looking at it in some models and maybe some pigs and so forth, they felt that it just didn't have a role, that the instrumentation was too cumbersome to get into the oral cavity and mouth and throat, and that it did not have a role in our specialty with the present technology, and no human had been done at that point. We happened to be in the audience um, at that listening be, uh, out of interest in the symposium. We knew Penn had a robot, not much was being done at the time. And so, so we thought maybe we should look at this interesting technology. Um, and I must say, when I was at Hopkins as a young faculty in 2005, I went over to Germany for a visiting professorship, young visiting professorship uh, uh, lecture. And the German head neck surgeons wanted to show me their new operating room, which was a beautiful operating room. And they had this huge piece of machinery in there that they were investigating it was a surgical robot. It was bigger than this whole room right here in terms of the robot. It cost tens of millions of dollars, I'm sure, at the time, they said. And I saw them trying to work on a tooth in the mouth. I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. But when I saw the symposium back in uh, the fall of 2004, um, and a young resident was with us, Neil Hochstein, and my colleague Greg Weinstein, in the partnership, we thought this has really changed. This is really advanced. This might be possible, even though they said it could be done. So this is our founding team. Uh, myself, Dr. Greg Weinstein, the robot. I'll go into some more details on the technology. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Neil Hoxstein, who was involved in our preclinical research as a resident research project. Great thing about Penn, stimulating resident research and discovery. So this whole thing came out of a resident research uh, 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 project with Neil and myself as the original proctor on that and then we moved into the clinical side which became Greg and I and we've advanced into the skull base. We have a, we're colleagues with our neurosurgeons. We have a big skull base program going on now to investigate neurosurgery and skull base kind of even more advanced uh, tumor applications and that's for another day. So the robot is um, a lot of technology. You can see all the expensive te te technology that goes on in the operating room but this is the main base this is where a camera sits that, that you can see three-dimensional optics, and that's the beauty of this. You see in three dimension. And then we have these um, small little, these are the big arms, and they have tiny little instruments down there. And these are the areas where the business is. That's what sneaks inside the mouth and throat to do the surgery. And they have these little five-millimeter instruments on the end. So they're miniature, miniature hands that go down into the, um, into the throat to do the surgery. So what are the advantages? Well, these little hands move actually more degrees of freedom than your own hand. They are more agile than your own hand. They're very precise in handling the tissues, tissues. You can do things like suturing way deep in the throat, which can't be done with the human hand, and hand trimmer filtration. So you can drink as much Starbucks fully leaded as you want every morning through the day, and there's no tremor. Hand doesn't shake at all because the robot filters it. Not that mine shakes, but at some point maybe so. Now motion scaling. Means you could take big movements and scale them down to uh, 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 small movements, six to one, four to one, which is very valuable when doing micro or very delicate surgery. And then basically, essentially, it's like shrinking your body. Honey, I shrunk the kids. Kids, if ever, everyone ever saw those series, climbing inside the mouth and going in and doing classic surgery, classic surgery, with um, tiny little robots. So the techniques are similar, although we've invented and, uh, and developed a whole new series of both surgical techniques and treatment paradigms. This is what a telescope looks like. It has two cameras and two light sources. That's about a centimeter there, actually 12 millimeters. They have smaller ones now. And that telescope can go right inside the mouth and you can take a look, look through a, a headpiece. It's actually a console that sits off to the side of the robot. And you look through these goggles and look at your, your hands. Your hands are in these little like video games. 
It's like a video game. You grab these little um, micro manipulators <coughs> and, and three dimensional, and you uh, do the surgery remotely, meaning that the robot is patients at the bed with the robot and assistant, and you're off to the side. Can you be in a different room? That is a I great. Different room. Room. Let me get to that. Is so that a variable depth of field. Uh, yes, it, it does have variable. It's all it's all high depth zoom, so you can zoom up and down both manually and with the optics. So with your fingers, what would be the depth of field maximum? Actually, I don't know that. Okay. I don't know that. So I don't know that. The, you could be within a few centimeters and be focused. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> so in a, in, a, in a given case, let's say like the one you showed us earlier with the gaping hole, how many of these units can be in operation at the same time? Just one. Just one Just robot. One. one robot at this point. There's three and four arms. Typically, we use only three arms for our head and neck procedure. This is us sitting at the console, not us, this is the, a, a model in, the, in this uh, uh, slide. This is a patient at the bedside, not doing head and neck. See, that's down in the belly in the, uh, in the prostate area. That's where it really started, and even the heart area. There's a console here. And here's another thing. There's a second console now teaching. So you can have two people operating at the same time or learning back and forth to help out. This is beautiful. These consoles can be in the same operating room, they can be in the operating room next door, they can be in the next state, they can be in the next city, they can be in the next country. In theory, the key, the key is the integrity of the transmission of data, which is hard through classic internet. But there's advanced internet too, and other high-speed dedicated internet portals that will allow telementoring, telesurgery, which has been done in spotty areas. We actually wrote a grant to that to the U.S. government to do telementoring for underdeveloped countries where we, instead of flying over there to operate, we sit with one console and work with them and the other, hand in hand with the surgeons. We thought it was a great I idea, it was not funded. The Two problem is that the volume of data being transferred is huge. It's huge, yes. And, and if it's transferred at high range. Right, and, and very dedicated. If there's other, if, there, if there's your email going on, uh, you yeah. know, or the other, you know, surfing the web, it'll <coughs> deteriorate the signal. And when you're operating on someone's head, neck, and skull area, you don't want that to happen. It is possible, though. So this is our eventual dream. Question, doing remote surgery on uh, our yacht, the Weinstein O'Malley yacht off the coast of Greece, where we can, you know, get in our bathing suits and on our consults after a morning swim and uh, remotely. And I bring this up, no, we don't have this yacht. And also want to point out we have no financial ties with the company. The company We have become consultants just recently, but the whole development period we didn't. And um, the, over the weekend of our approval, the stock gained, uh, the company gained $3 billion dollars and uh, in profits and has grown uh, from a six dollar share to a three hundred sixty dollar share company since the time we worked for them we invested nothing and gained nothing from that or took nothing from that so we do think they owe us a yacht one day um but let's talk about the the the, the issue here and uh, one of the issues in overcoming a new technology or bring up innovation is the skeptics okay so this is an important slide i think because this sums up what we face through the whole course of our um our odyssey and maybe the outcome even so this, if you, you all rem if you could recognize Alexander Graham Bell and the early prototype of the telephone. So this young inventor tried to market and sell this great pr uh, product. So what do you think? He said, well, let's go to the number one communications um, company in the world, Western Union. Western Union famous for its telegraph, for the railroads, you know, huge communication. That was state of the art. So they looked at it in detail, and, and their comment to Graham Bell was, the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. There, so be it. So as, as we know, Western Union is now sending money here and there at the most, but ATTs and Verizon's all order. So you see what happened to those who um, were skeptical. We knew the skeptics existed in our specialty. They exist every time change occurs or anyone produces change, particularly innovation and particularly ways that if someone wants to bring it without science. Being from Penn, being having scientific backgrounds, our team wanted to take a scientific approach to the development of TORS. We began with a hypothesis in October of 2004, and that was that the Da Vinci robotic surgical system, using commercially available technology and instrumentation, is more efficient and less invasive than classic, other classic minimally invasive or open strategies for these complex head and neck procedures. When we advanced in 2006 into something called skull-based surgery, which is approaching and working with neurosurgeons to take tumors around the eye and base of the brain and so forth. Um, in order to test this hypothesis, we had a development strategy in our methods. We had four phases, like our four aims, maybe, in a grand proposal. The first one was doing mannequin experiments to test the feasibility of robotic alignment. Can you get these cumbersome robot arms that were designed to work in the big belly to get down inside the mouth and do this and, and, and not bang all over the place? Can you set up an operating room? Can you even move in mannequins 
Um, if that were to be successful, we'd move into cadaver. That would be human people, humans who donated their body for science, um, and they would, we'd look at manipulation of tissues and actually performing classic procedures or developing new surgical procedures. Should that be successful, we'd move into live animal uh, canine experiments um, to look at uh, live surgery, handling of secretion, safety, bleeding, and so forth. Should that be successful, we'd move into phase four. That would be a prospective human study to look at the feasibility and therefore and later outcomes of transoral robotic surgery. So this was early work. Neil Hoxton was very helpful in making this happen. These are the kind of different schematics of the uh, looking at to try to arrange these arms. So these are kind of cumbersome big arms that have to be uh, delicately arranged to go in the mouth. That took about 14 hours with multiple intuitive engineers to see if to make that happen. It seemed pretty simple, but it was very complicated. Once we got it, it's very re reproducible. Then we developed uh, ways to not to use retractors. We actually, Weinstein and I developed this new retractor set up for transoral robotic surgery that opens the mouth and pushes away the tongue or other tissue so you can get access with the robot. And here's the telescope going in, in three dimension. And this is the le left and right arm, like your left and right arm in surgery. It'd be the same as if we were doing surgery. We have developed a scheme of the operating room with limited, efficient instrumentation. We have, we have a scrub, uh, an assistant, who's right at this point, another fellow physician or trainee, a nurse, ourselves, anesthesiologist, kind of the key room, and then we have some circulating other people. So we looked at efficiency and flow within the operating room to make this happen, and then ways in which we can work with the assistant versus the surgeon and so forth to do the procedures. So we've put, put a lot of time in developing the practical nature of addressing this so it could be reproducible and time efficient. Are the patients tracheotomized at this time? No. We actually trach the very first few patients, and very rarely do we do a trach, so it's a huge... So what keeps a patient there with? Well, this is the... the angle in that... This, yeah, this is the neat aspect of about that. When you don't have to, we don't reconstruct. This is a big deal. We don't do those. That's why our surgeries, and I'll show you the data, are two hours, two and a half hours versus 14 hours. When you don't have to borrow tissue from somewhere and, and open the mouth and make those big cuts and put it in, and you get swelling from that, the, the amount of swelling we get is, is negligible, even though we make big holes inside the mouth, but it stays contained and doesn't swell. So with aspiration, you can just keep the mucus down or there's no problem? You don't aspirate. No. You know, because you, what we leave is functional. Versus when you put big tissue in or you cut through it, you create dysfunction along the way in tissues that, should, that aren't being operated on just to get there. And then you put dysfunctional tissue in to cover up the wound and separate the mouth from the neck. We don't need all that. So everything left is still functional and sensate, so they can sense secretions and, and so forth. When the surgeon does this procedure, where does he stand vis-a-vis -vis the patient in a, uh, in, in a little... Cubicle yeah, off to the side. There. We're right back here. And you're looking into a, a computer or computer box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And working so with those is little this controls. An anesthesiologist no, there? this is the nurse. This is our assistant. The anesthesiologist is going to be back here. Mm -hmm. That's our assistant. It's one of our former fellows, Deb Basu, who's now a faculty member at Penn. He was one of the early trainees. <coughs> so this is what how, the how long would it take someone who decides to do it? Uh, how long would it take for him to become competent? We'll get to that later in the question. Great question. You were on that FDA panel, weren't you, who asked us that same thing? Because we had approved teachability. We'll go into that later. We were the only group ever to perform approved teachability to get FDA approval, including heart surgery and anything. It was really wild. They just were scared of, uh, of head neck, and rightly so. It's good to be safe. This shows you kind of the um, um, arms moving outside the cavity. Part of the criticism in the early days at that at that. Um, presentation at our academy in 2004 was that these arms would move around and they'd rip tissue and hurt the patient. The movement is inside the mouth, not outside. So it's very safe, exceedingly safe. That's one question. So probably you're taking out less tissue with this method. We're taking out, no, we're actually taking out the same amount of tissue. Wow. We're just not being as destructive getting in there. And we're, ta we're not borrowing tissue that doesn't belong in the mouth and throat and sticking it back in there as a big lump or wad to cover a, a defect. We let the body heal itself. Okay. But, but it's, it's not that you might have more danger of metastasis because you're not actually having too much. No, we don't have. Well, I, I'll show you our data. We have the best data in the world right now in terms of treating oropharyngeal cancer. <coughs> or none, any treatment modality, and I'll show you that. So it all looked very good. I, am not sh I didn't have time in this talk to show you all our cadaver work, all our dog experimentation, and so forth. I want to move right on for the sake of time into kind of the human data. But we did this over a very r rapid period of time. So by May of 2005, we initiated our um, prospective study, had already enrolled some patients in 
uh, in their human trial. And that was a simple starting trial, 65 patients, assess feasibility. Can we really even get the robot in to access the tumor in the human? If we could get it in, then we would have secondary objectives. Can we actually perform the procedure? If we can perform the procedure, we follow operative time, blood loss, and complications. So we, um, we were all excited about this, very excited, and we went to a, our spring meeting in our specialty called COSM, Combined Olaryngology Spring Meeting. There was a big head and neck forum, and I was talking in one room, and Greg Weinstein was talking in the other room on our early preclinical work on cadavers, and maybe we talked about the initiation of the trial in the first human patient. We were all excited. We were thinking everyone would be excited. And um, it's amazing. After that lecture, in my room at least, and I, I won't name any names, but they're good, they're good friends and colleagues who, who respect me and I respect them, stood up and said, O'Malley, you're crazy. This is crazy. This doesn't make any sense. This is expensive technology. You, you know, you, use your resources on something else. We've already got chemotherapy radiation. We don't need this. This is not going to make a difference. You know, it's been shown. All, all kind. And that was multiple, multiple senior colleagues. Our senior colleagues, the leaders in our specialty, world leaders, got up nicely because we're friends, and they basically, you know, said this is crazy. What am I doing? Um, but. Um, the only person who came up afterwards was a 32-year-old resident who was all excited and said, boy, this is going to be something. We're all excited about that. And, and that was it. And the same story occurred with Dr. Weinstein in his room. Senior colleagues got up and just lambasted this as, you know, you know why are we reinventing the wheel and wasting all this money and doing things that don't need to be done? Focus your efforts on other, other things. So, so you're the guy in the red <laughs> This is us. And the funny thing is, this is our specialty. This is the surgeons. This was our colleagues and our peers and our senior leaders who are basically absolutely knocking this, this, this new innovation. Despite we've had, I think we've probably had six publications in that short period of time on all our preclinical work and our initiation of a trial. And they, they just didn't want to hear anything about it. So it, it, we were reading this book, or, or this was actually given to us by someone once on it's called Crossing the Chasm. It's a book in marketing and businesses by a guy named Jeffrey Moore who apparently is pretty famous in those areas. And he really explores the diffusion of innovations. And they use this as a model in industry. So being medicine, we're so focused on medicine, we're not really looking at industry. Um, but this book apparently had significant impact in, on the high-tech entrepreneurship and development. And director of Stanford Technology in 2006 Ventures Program described it as still the Bible for entrepreneurial marketing 15 years since the book. So this guy apparently had it down when it came to developing innovations in the business. And a key aspect of the, the, the issue was crossing this chasm. And what in, in development of innovation, what Moore uh, portrays is that you have the innovators or techies, the people who come up with the new innovative concept. But in order to make it happen, they need to get some early adopters, people who start using it and testing it, far-thinking, open-minded people who are willing to try it. But then a big chasm occurs. This big chasm is broad and steep because you have to cross that and get to the pragmatists or the early majority, people who really are, are not, are, you know, very, are relatively conservative and they need a lot of data and they need a lot of confidence and they need a lot of rationale or they're not going to do it. And then there's the late majorities that are very conservative who don't want anything unless it's fully proven and shown and makes sense and they don't want to test anything. And then there's always the laggards or the skeptics. No matter what, they don't want anything to do with this. It just doesn't make sense and it, or it's different from what they're doing or, they're, or, or, or whatever the reasons there are. And that most uh, innovations die in the early adopter stage and can't cross the chasm. And that's the, the, that's the issue behind this, this Moore book. So we kept on our phase four. We kept enrolling patients. We kept getting data. We kept publishing and publishing and publishing. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of what the numbers of these kinds of operations, not your technique, but overall, that occur in the United States every year? I don't have that data on me. I know that 80% of all prostate Surgery is done uh, uh, with the robot right now at present time, and so I would say there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of surgeries done in the U.S. and probably millions worldwide. I probably could get that data for if you wanted no, some. No, but transorally. Oh, transorally. Well, we we invented and developed it, so uh, well, every well, yeah back. everyone's trained by us. We've trained probably 200 people right now, and I don't know the, the amount of cases we personally have done over 500. And I would say there's thousands of done right now in the U.S. and, and rapidly growing. And I'll get to some data later on. Okay. Example Sir, of a cancer? Sir, yeah. I think what Howard's asking is what's what's the incidence of occurrence of head and neck cancers? Head and neck cancers, 500,000 cases worldwide. In the U.S., it's 45,000. Of the 45,000 in the head and neck region, probably realistically what's acceptable, applicable to the cancer side of tours that we portray is about 9,000 cases. 
Okay, that said, TORS has gone well beyond this cancer in terms of uh, other issues. I don't have time to go into that here, but it, we have a prospective study for sleep apnea going on. That's 9 to 10 million Americans. That's obstructive sleep apnea, not overall apnea. That's around 40 million, but obstructive sleep apnea. So this, this, our development is now being tested in a 9 to 10 million U.S. Uh, potential market. So it's unbelievably huge is where this is going to go. And I think it's panning out in early studies, but that's a later talk. Um, so this is an example of a cancer I showed you on um, the last slide, and this is the robot uh, taking out. This is an area that we can't normally access without some really wild technology. And here's the tumor down here. And this is the robot. This is a, a, called a bovi cautery, what we would do in classic open surgery. And we're cutting tissue around it's it. It's cauterizing. It looks like it's, it's cutting. It's cutting and cauterizing. Cauterizing. It's blended, cutting and cauterizing, called mm -hmm. a blend. Um, sometimes we cauterize if we bleed. This is the tube in the throat. This is a cancer, very hard to see, but the robot can sneak around and see it. And we take a wide cuff of tissue. So this is classic end block wide resection. We got a big healthy margin so that we make sure we get around those tumors. And that's a big aspect of this surgery. So this is like a classic open approach done with a tiny little telescope and some little arms. And these are five millimeters, these big blown up arms, so they're, they're really tiny. What would be the <coughs> prognosis uh, an untreated <coughs> a patient with that kind of <coughs> Across the board, 50%, maybe it could be upwards of 60% of all head and neck cancer patients die. I mean, die or survive. 50% die or survive, and maybe 60% now. But over what period of time? Three years. And it's devastating. The most destructive, painful way to die there is, is head and neck cancer. You know, and I'm not knocking any of it. Terror cancer is a terrible thing, absolutely terrible thing. But head and neck cancer eats you from the inside, right through your jaw and mouth, into your throat. And it does it slowly over three years, and, to, and, and it's excruciating painful, as well as other aspects of drainage and smell, and it's just unbelievably destructive. So this is it, a it terrible, is, terrible thing. Smoking is still the main Smoking, culprit. but I'll, I'll go over later and it's a slide, human papillomavirus is on the rise. Oh, yeah. And that's becoming one of the top causes of oral cancer. So, so uh, I'm not quite sure, are you saying that, aside from the, the, a lot less mess and so on, does it uh, increase the longevity, the survival time? Let me show you that data. I'll show you that data later if that's okay. But Bert, your back was turned. That big chunk of something they took out, that was the tumor. That was the tumor. Yeah. We just did this operation. So use your thumb. How, how big is that, for example? Um, it's the size of a, um, a large walnut. So pretty big. That hold my whole thumb. That, that little thing I did there in 35 minutes took that previous procedure I showed you at the beginning. That's, what, that's the only way really to do that. I say only, there's other ways. That's one of the key ways and classic ways to get there. That was done in 35 minutes. Um, and this, 35 minutes from when to when? From the surgical time, of the beginning surgery to the end of surgery. There's overall surgical time. I'll go into this data. I, we've got, we had a fully timed person timing every single aspect of it. Because you know, a, sur a surgeon's time is this. It only took me 30 minutes, which meant it took you at least three hours. And that was, so that's a given, you know, but th that's classic surgical time. We timed everything with an objective person. That's the defect in the tongue all the way to the hyoid bone, so a pretty big hole you take out. That's the voice box. So you mentioned swelling there, Jim. See, there's swelling here, but it's not too bad, and you can swallow mm -hmm. and, and the secretions and handle that. And that's five days after TORS. What's this the, is three weeks. Tea, Base of tongue, oh, sorry. Base of tongue. Tolerating a full diet at three weeks. Um, it's all filling in. Look how it's healing with sensate material. And this is the cancer on a PET scan. So this is where the cancer was right here, pretty big. This is post-op and post-radiation. So the radiation's created a little destruction at there. And there's an only a small defect and everything else is fully functional. This patient fully eats and has no problems and has no tumor at this point. So how do you, how do you know the, the border limits of the tumor? That's based on the, 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 the x-ray studies or the, the X-ray studies? studies, your physical exam, your operative view and palpation, and the pathologist. So it's a it's a broad team effect in approaching these tumors. But these tumors do they have radiation fingers coming? They out can, of them? but not as broad as you say. They have small. They're limited probably to a few millimeters in general. But they could they could track along nerves and so forth. And these are why these tumors are hard to, to control and why big surgeries needed to try to get around some of these fingers. Do you sample lymph nodes? Around? We do. When they have lymph node, uh, uh, certain sizes or lymph nodes in the neck, we will actually second stage, do a separate procedure for that's about in a two hour two, come back and do a second neck procedure to remove the lymph nodes if needed. 
2006, we increased to 130 patients in our human study. We did speech and swallowing outcomes, added overall quality and quality of life, our uh, uh, metrics, and we expanded in 2009 to 250 patients to look at tumor recurrence and survival. And at 2011, we have over 500 patients enrolled, numerous clinical trials ongoing, and data and publications that I'll go over some briefly. So let's look at our first 62 patients. This was the first study I mentioned, 62, 65 patients, prospective study um, to look at feasibility. St setting up the operating time when you don't have a robot to maybe do what we were going to do as a biopsy or small resection is 7 minutes and 55 seconds. The robot time added 12 minutes and 53 seconds to our uh, setup time uh, when we started. And now we're down to only 9 minutes, maybe 7 to 9 minutes. That's all the robot adds to setting up an OR now because of the efficiency of our team. The time to perform the classic operation was 89 minutes and 53 seconds. That included analyzing frozen section. That means when we take this out of the patient, we go up to the pathologist, or our, one of our assistants is down there watching the patient with the anesthesiologist and so forth. <coughs> Once we know the patient's stable, we walk right upstairs, right above us. We look at with the pathologist under the microscope. They have to fix it and so forth, and look at it to see that we got around it in all dimensions. That's about a 25 minute procedure, and sometimes we do it twice, but usually just once. And so that includes that time in terms of that. Now in the operating room to out of it, meaning that the time the patient gets into the room before they go to sleep, preparation, going to sleep with anesthesia, doing the surgery, waking up, average time is two hours and 32 minutes. Two hours and 32 minutes. Even if you added a later neck dissection, that's a three hours, it's a significant savings. Um, do you have a tube going into the trachea for, for anesthesia? Through the mouth, correct. And we work around it. <clears throat> What's the free flop? Oh, that's a patient that barred, like, classically we did a robot, but they had such a, a bad big tumor and some other issues that we had to borrow some tissue from the arm to put in there. Um, and that was a long, that's a 13-hour case or so. Um, so, we, uh, in the early phases, we knew we needed to try to teach this. We talk about teachability and needs. So we had a workshop. It's called a workshop. At the time, we brought up some key kind of uh, innovative surgeons. Interesting enough, and I'm not interesting enough, everyone was under 50. No one over 50 wanted to come. We asked a few. Um, and so they, we brought some of our younger colleagues who, to go to California to train them on the robot. We needed to find those early adopters based on George Moore's book. And so we selected uh, some of those and people who were skilled in minimally invasive surgery and had advanced training and so forth. Um, so we began in fall of 2006, we training our early adopters and they we gave them our IRB study, we helped them enroll prospective studies in their institution to follow similar metrics and follow along with what we have done. And they all embraced it and they started their studies. Um, this is our advanced oropharyngeal cancer human study. It's a cohort study. We have multiple cohort, that means we're taking a focus group of, of people, 47 young adults, advanced stage three and stage four, that's the highest stage, stage four. 43 men, 4 women from 2005 to 2007. We wanted about two and a half year outcome, which is what the literature wants. And basically, a lot of data here you don't have to see. But 15% of these patients avoided radiation all in all. That's, that's very big. And 38% avoided chemotherapy. And that's very big. To be able to avoid any one of those means you can narrow down the treatment because either radical surgery, plus or minus radiation, or radical chemo radiation is destructive. And we were able to kind of narrow that down and focus our therapy, or de-intensify, we call it. Yes? So do the criteria for being able to avoid one of these other treatments depend on what, uh, whether the margin will clear or... Correct. No margin dollar. clears, number of nodes, there's pr pathologic parameters. And that's very important, because when you go to chemotherapy and radiation, you don't have the pathology of the number of nodes or the depth of invasion of the primary tumor or is it on nerves or vasculature. So you give hard ra radical chemo radiation, which is fine. But when we do surgery, we can have the benefit of having the path pathologic data. So there's certain criteria we've developed with our radiation docs that were existing and we've even expanded with our radiation and chemo doctors at Penn and a multidisciplinary effort to treat this disease and develop these comprehensive treatment paradigms so that we can reduce and carefully select those patients and tailor individual therapies using all that's out there in a less invasive or de-intensified way to each patient. It's, it's really cool. Um, Couple, you got to go over complications. We had two peg, early on we put tubes in the stomach, the pegs anyway, and they were removed later, but we put them on, they had some infection, one over two, they all recovered. Um, now we almost put no pegs in people now, at all. Um, one pneumonia, 
no intraoperative or perioperative deaths, no life-threatening bleeds, no long-term tracheostomies. The first two patients we put trachs in because we didn't know when that was classic, so we didn't know what was going to happen. Then after that, we realized we could do it without swelling, and we continued. Um, margins, key is can you get around the cancer? This is pathology. Only one of 47 patients had a positive margin. That's defined as less than two millimeters. That's excellent data. That's as good as it gets on the surgical side. And this is our local, regional, and distant disease control at two and a half, little over two years. 97.8% local control, 95% regional, and 91% distant. And actuarially, disease-specific survival at one and two years are 97 to 90%. Excellent data. And I'll show you how that compares to the net norms. Just review what that idea of margin means. In other words, you've taken the tumor out, but there's something around the rim that's still bad. Right. The margin is if it's close, these little fingers you mentioned, Jim, they can get out and cause it to recur. You need, I mentioned it's about two millimeters, you need in general over two millimeters. Some say three or four, but our data has been over two millimeters to feel good around most classic tumors. If you're less than that, you have a higher risk of recurrence. Doesn't mean it will, but then you may need to do more radiation and chemo. So this is an interesting, so when you look, you, when head and neck cancer, and this will come back later, that there's no prospective objective controlled study for pharyngeal cancer. So there's other cohort studies in chemotherapy and radiation, and that had become the standard. Chemotherapy radiation has become the standard of treatment um, uh, for oropharyngeal cancer. So the, these are a lot of articles and people who treated um, patients and the people who were swallowing, they looked at swallowing without that tube in your stomach. Now that doesn't mean you even could taste well or even swallow much and it, 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 it could take you two hours to get your food down, but at least you don't need the tube called a peg in your stomach. You can go through mouth. 7.5 to 35% of people require a peg to sustain their uh, nutrition for the rest of their life. Maybe some after years and years it might get better, but usually it doesn't, but it can, I guess. So this is our PEN data. 0% of the patients treated at PEN with our tours and our specialized radiation protocol that we're teaching as well had requirements of a PEG. One patient in our study would not get radiation at PEN. It was early on. They went elsewhere, very reputable place, but they, they didn't believe in tours. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't really communicate with us, and they gave them classic radiation at high doses, and the patient uh, has never been able to swallow since then. So everyone treated at PEN in our study, and this continues, with this strategy, can swallow without a PEG. Um, so if you compare the, the kind of the two best in the literature with ours, we have more patients than the other cohorts for oropharyngeal cancer. We have the longest uh, outcome or survival, and you look at survival, local, regional, and distant, it's about the same. You know, some, uh, if you look at recurrence, we might be lower in the percentages, but there's not enough data, you know, in a, in a comparative study to make that statistically significant. But um, it looks like our data is at least the same and, and looks by, by first view as being lower. But what we can say is we're at least as good in survival as any other therapy, including the mainstay or anything published to date. But the PEG rates for some of these top studies were 8 and 12 percent. Ours was 0 percent of our patients at Penn, 2.4 if you include the patient who went elsewhere. So HPV has become very hot. It's a growing human papillomavirus. Probably one of the fastest growing components of head and neck cancer is oropharyngeal, tonsil, back of the tongue, throat cancer related to certain strains of the HPV virus. Similar to cervical cancer in women and the cause there. Not quite as high, but, but probably pretty close to is, is getting there. I don't know the exact numbers. But there was a national study done that looked at outcomes if you have HPV positive or negative tumors. And I'll summarize overall survival and everything. Let me summarize here. If you look at three-year survival, which is a key hurdle, two-year you look pretty good, but if you look at three-year in the HPV positive, 80% of the patients survive from chemoradiation at three years. And then the swallowing peg rates are as I showed. So that's pretty good. If you're HPV negative, only 50% at best. That's terrible if you're HPV negative. So if you're HPV negative, you don't do well. This is our study at Penn. We just published this. It's come out. We looked at three year, 50 <coughs> patients enrolled, HPV positive and negative. This is our disease specific survival. It's, it's, you know, it's tremendous. HPV positive and negative are the same. Now if you looked at overall outcomes, not necessarily from the disease, I'll show you some people are at comorbidities, they're smokers or they might be drinkers or they have other heart problems or they're older that they have medical problems that they may not survive from their cancer. But disease specific survival is 90.5% in HPV positive and 100% in HPV negative. A somewhat small cohort, but it's, a, it's, it's data and it's great data. And our overall survival was 82%, you know, similar 
but our disease specific was 90 for the HPV positive and 100% for HPV negative. Some people died of other causes because they, these were high smokers and drinkers and the HPV negative and they had heart disease and so forth. So this is the best data out there. Almost so good that if you have an HPV negative patient, you almost have to uh, offer surgery or you're, you're not giving them the best care. If you went on to chemo radiation, it might be a, a, a difficult thing to, to tell a patient that when the data looks so poor versus our data. So now back to, remember these guys? These, uh, the uh, colleagues who were, uh, we trained, they started publishing along, it, uh, along the way, and this was all exciting. They published, and they published their papers <coughs> and data on their study and outcomes, and all, all these guys from the different institutions published as well and published and kept publishing. Um, and so we made it. We made it to the chasm. We got through <coughs> these early adopters. They got on. They're doing the study. They're publishing the results. They're having great data and outcome, um, and now we're at the chasm. Now we have to cross that chasm. So here's, I could go on to lots of uh, stories, but I'll go a couple patients. This is CM. She was found, uh, she had a little cold when she was in Florida, about to go to the islands for a, a vacation. She went to see a local doctor in Florida who looked at her mouth and said, oh my God, you've got a big problem. We've got to go right to the operating room. They went in and biopsied and found out she had a tumor. Non-cancerous tumor now. Now we're talking non-cancer. Non-cancerous tumor in the back of the throat. They rec she was seen by a local uh, uh, well-known institution that recommended the thing I showed you earlier, big broken jaw, cut, opening the neck, um, that type of big procedure for this eight and a half centimeter tuber from her carotid to her skull base through her mouth. Huge tumor. Facial scarring, you know, trach tube, tube in the stomach, losing some teeth. She basically, she's a motivational speaker and a hospital executive and said, that's my life. She said, I'd rather die. Now, she wouldn't die right away from this benign tumor, but eventually it suffocated her. She would rather die than have that. So she came to see me at, at Penn. I said the same thing. This is huge, but this is probably the standard is you got to do the jaw split. This is what you should do. The other recommendation was correct. She had read about TORS. She wanted TORS. I talked to her in detail. This is you know pretty big. It's you know it's, it's still new. We're developing this. I'm willing to look at that only if she understands it's a study and we can do this. And I can't guarantee her outcomes except I think I could do it safely. But I don't know you know what will happen. And this is the this is the brain here. This is the neck, that's down here, that's the voice box right here, and this is up here. So that's what this tumor span. And this is her whole throat and mouth, that she's breathing out of this little airway, this little tiny little uh, dribbling of an airway, and that's the tumor, 8.5 centimeters in size. We did that procedure, it's 45 minutes, tours, right through the mouth, no cuts, no broken jaw, no cuts on the face, one day in the hospital, and then she went home. And here's an example. I don't think this was this was either her, her or another big one we did, but this is what basically how we approached this tumor. Called a uh, parapharyngeal space pleomorphic adenoma, benign tumor of salivary tissue. And they're making cut. There's the this is the back of the throat and the jawbone up high in the mouth, the jawbone. We're making these cuts. And we're gonna go down behind the linings down into the throat, right on the carotid artery, jugular vein, vagus nerve, big arteries, veins, and nerves in the neck. Find this tumor and dissect it out. This is it. We've got through tissues and muscles of the throat. We're cutting here, and there's a big tumor right down there. And I think this one, this one might have been the six centimeter tumor versus hers. I don't, I don't have her video edited, but it's a similar procedure. Very delicate work. This thing sits right on and bows the entire carotid artery. You have to be very careful and very delicate when you do this work. Has the tumor become vasculated? No, it's not. This one is not that vascular. And so this one, yeah, this was only a six and a half centimeter, six centimeter one. This is slightly smaller, but that was a big tumor. And that's what we can do. And then we close it up. Um, and this is her, CM. She's become a motivational speaker for TORS right now. Um, she has no tumor. Tumor's gone, no tumor anywhere in her MRI. She's doing fabulous. One how more. Many, how many years out is she? She's two and a half years out, I think, right now. I, I, two or two and a half. Um, 72 year old woman, nearby state. Had a five years prior, had a little biopsy of a benign tumor in her voice box, her throat down here. She had a husband who was a medicine physician who was sick and ill. She wanted to care for them, didn't want to go through the surgery. She was doing fine, so it was okay. But over the course of five years, she developed progressive problems sleeping, called sleep apnea. She choked at night and couldn't breathe. She developed asthma, you know, in the lungs. She, she was wheezing, and they diagnosed her with asthma. She had um, active strider. <gasps> That's how she breathed. When she was sitting in my office, she had oxygen dependence. So oxygen cannula is in her nose at all times. She couldn't eat. She had a peg tube place because she couldn't eat. She had weight loss, hypertension, and had lost weight. She basically was dying of suffocation and blood pressure results from this tumor. The MRI showed about a 3.5 centimeter tumor obstructing the superglottic mass, and still she was caring for her husband. 
Um, she was referred to another major institution. They recommended classic open cuts through the throat, seven to ten day hospital stay, eight hour surgery, tracheostomy tube, and so forth. And she wasn't sure she could tolerate it, and her physicians weren't sure she could tolerate it. She uh, had heard about TOR. She was referred to us. This is the tumor. It's kind of like putting a lime right in the middle of your voice box. She was bare, she couldn't. You don't even see where you could breathe. She was sitting around just going. <gasps> That's how she was breathing. It was terrible and slowly suffocating to death. It's an absolutely terrible way to go. Um, and so she had this, and we thought we could do tours. We talked to her carefully about it, and uh, it made sense. We have a tremendous anesthesiology team and head and neck team at Penn, unbelievable, who helped get the airway and deal with the lump. And here it is. This is, the vo this is down into the voice box. That's something called the epiglottis that flaps over your voice box and protects your airway and you swallow. We're working down with this robot at this tumor down there, big old tumor sitting in the throat. What's the white tumor? This is the breathing tube that's into the voice, uh, into the uh, airway to breathe. And you can see this thing filled the whole, that, that's what you're supposed to breathe through down there. She was barely breathing through it and our anesthesia team managed that real well. This took 18 minutes of operative time and probably in two hours going in and out of the room with that, maybe less than an hour, hour and a half. Very careful to get all this tumor out. Um, here it is, basically a shortened version, but here you'll see how big this tumor is, and this is her little airway. Look at that's what she's, it fills her whole, that's what she was trying to breathe around. Unbelievable. Um, and there it is right here. No, it, it's bilobe, but it was one, one part. It was three and a half centimeters in size in the airway. So one week post-op, she had no need for oxygen supplement. She's breathing fine. The feeding tube was removed that she had for I don't know how many years. She resumed normal eating, swallowing. Her sleep apnea resolved, her hypertension and asthma went away, and she could care for her husband. It was because she was suffocating. That's what was causing all that. So it was very really neat. She wrote this <coughs> note, and this kind of exemplifies some of the fun parts of why we do this. It says, Dear Dr. O'Malley, you have brought a miraculous change in my life. I now can swallow normally, do not have to force feed my medications, do not need oxygen at night, and feel like a new, a new way of life has opened for me. How can I ever repay your kindness and skill for making this possible? I never can, so I'll simply say, may God bless you for your kindness and help in changing my entire outlook. But you accept donations for research. We, do. <laughs> we, we didn't ask this lady. That was enough to give us. That was an amazing <coughs> gift to, to hear that back. Um, and um, that's, what, that's what innovation does sometimes. And, and this is what TORS does. So TORS is growing in the U.S. Over the years we started training, our early adopters were taking off. Uh, doing more procedures. It was, it's been the fastest adopted robotic surgical to date. Not in numbers, because prostate's bigger than other things. The fastest adopted. Why? Because we approach it scientifically. Everyone else kind of did it, and they said, and they, they was just trying to do a new surgery. We pro approach this prospectively and scientifically. And this is um, international and U.S. growing here. Most of these were us in the U.S. and uh, <coughs> our, our early adopters in the internet nations were working on it. And then big success. December 2009, we did a study, we had to show teachability and show that other institutions how long it took, about 20 cases to get to our safety and time of doing tours. Outcomes, we still have the best outcomes published right now at Penn, but everyone's getting pretty close to that. So this FDA approved tours for uh, uh, T1, T2 cancers in the back of the throat and all benign disease, such as you saw with CM and with the other lady I showed you. So within two months after the FDA approval, over 100 surgeons at almost every academic institution in the U.S. and Cancer Center have signed up to be trained in TORS. Now I think almost every center in the U.S. has signed up. We're booked. We've been booked for the past year. We train every week. Forty international surgeons were previously trained, 50 now, and there are more coming. So they, they, you can't get in. We've, we've actually initiated multiple training sites to train the amount of people. Um, and this is one of our recent publications on our outcomes of tonsil that came out that, that, that helped pave the way. And we work with our radiation colleagues. And a big aspect of radiation is when you have a big tumor, see this tumor, when radiation doctors have to radiate the field, they have to cover the, all the way across the throat, get all this area, all this normal appearing tissue for something that's actually only really stuck and growing right down here. But that's how they have to do the field. So we work with our radiation doctors. And then when we do surgery, after surgery, we can only look at a little bit of the field. We decrease the damage and the amount of radiation that goes to the tumor, and that's what helps the patients. So we've initiated prospective studies. We're not even radiating the primary site, and some no radiation at all now once we have negative margins. So by May of 2010, we crossed the chasm. We're into the early pragmatists. They're signing up. Even some of the conservatives are jumping on board. Skeptics still exist. 
but we really made it across the chasm. This is accepted, this is growing, the outcomes are looking the same, people are being helped across the world. But our skeptics, and, I, and if I need to stop, I can right now, I know we're asking questions along the way, so I can stop. Does anyone want to stop or do you want to hear these last parts? Or? I want to hear the last parts. Okay, so we still had the critics, and the critics came to us and they said, but O'Malley and Weinstein, in order for this to be widely adopted, let me show you, it's, we're almost over the hump, but this is an, these are the same people who still said no to us when we were back in 2005. It's still the giant in the room is still in the room, and that's our specialty, that's our college, and some of the radiation chemo doctors. They said, you need level one data. You need to have a prospective controlled study. That's, that's what science is in the drug world. You need to have level one prospective data to show TORS is as good or better than chemo rads because this is what we all need. Okay, and that's what they came to saying. It's not going to be accepted until that happens. Well, there's been no published prospective randomized trial for level one evidence for oropharyngeal cancer anywhere. And yet we have to do it? That's not how surgical disease evolves. There's nothing wrong with level one evidence. It's a good thing, but this is surgery. So the whole aspect of surgical equipoise, which is a different equipoise, which is a different talk, is involved in, in how to uh, innovate and develop surgical and cancer therapies. There is nothing for us to compare it to. All the stuff I showed you today was, was cohort studies like we did. We did the same thing as everyone has done, including the chemo radiation. And yet it's, and chemo radiation has never been a level one and yet it's the standard. Interesting. So less than 2% of all surgical series have been studied with prospective randomization. That doesn't mean not good, that there wasn't good science. There's good science, there's cohort studies, there's prospective approved, there's critical peer review. But in surgery, you know, when you, if you have a patient who has an HPV negative tumor, and they're coming in and you want to say, you can, we're going to randomize you to either chemo radiation or TORS plus maybe radiation or not, depending on the pathology. It's wrong. How could you do that? How could you feel good about it? That's the problem if you've got a, a cohort study that looks as good as anything published. You can't feel good about that. You maybe can make up a different study and have to do it, but, but we wouldn't know where to go. But you can't do that to a patient because you know the data. Would you do that with animal studies? Uh, not in tumors and so forth. And, and remember, you... Not the 90, there's only one prospective study in our specialty of head and neck prospective study that's well in terms of surgical arm, and I'll show you that. So this is for the skeptics. We found this paper in the Hazardous Journeys publication that, that is, must everything be prospectively randomized for level one to be, or will level one be accepted? This is parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenges. A systemic, <laughs> systemic review of randomized controlled trials. It's kind of funny, I know, but think of the parallel. This is what we're talking about. So the abstract was to determine whether parachutes are effective in presenting major trauma related to gravitational challenge. They did a systematic review of all randomized controlled trials. They looked at the webs and other areas. Um, the main outcome was death or major trauma, um, and defined as an injury score greater than 15. The results, they were unable to find any randomized trials to support using a parachute when jumping out of a plane. So conclusion, they came up with this conclusion. As with many interventions, and you've got to look at surgery. I'm not downplaying the science. I'm just saying you can get so focused in trying to apply all levels of science across all specialties, it doesn't always work. Or we never have a parachute. Same, same, same story. That as with many inter interventions intended to prevent ill health, the effectiveness of a parachute has not been subjected to rigorous evaluation using randomized controlled trials. Advocates of evidence-based medicine have criticized the adoption of intervention evaluated by using only obser observational data. So they're saying ours plus everything else in our literature is observational, so this is a big criticism. We've got to do something. So what this journal thought, they had a good idea. They think that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists and pundits of, this, of the uh, uh, parachute enrolled in a random placebo-controlled trial uh, for the use of parachute or not jumping out of the plane. And that was their uh, goal. And no, you don't need a level one. There is one study, very nice study by the VA done at the University of Michigan, a prospective level one evidence trial looking at chemo radiation for the, uh, versus radiation with surgery salvage, a very nice, elegant study over many years. Um, published uh, another paper, New England Journal of Medicine, based on that. Um, the problem with this is while it was able to save a voice box, the um, survival rates have gone down. So laryngeal cancer is the only cancer in our specialty where survival's gone down. And we had changed our, and we moved from surgery because of our level one evidence showing that we could save the voice box. But we've done that as a sacrifice of survival. Now that's okay, it's a choice a patient may want to make. But, but we've got the, the prototype uh, level one, which is an awesome study, 
that has ended up resulting in decreased survival of our patients through pushing a paradigm shift away from surgery. So, you know, you got to watch. It's a great study. Patients should know these options either way, but it doesn't always uh, assure survival. Um, and I can go on. So, so we've continued to publish, publish, and publish. We've got some great data showing the best outcomes of protecting the neck with our pictors, plus doing some limited neck dissections with radiation. It looks great. Um, quality of life, patients coming back to pre-treatment quality of life. So we've published in quality of life. Um, and we looked at cost. Okay, so cost is a big factor. Now it comes down to cost, okay? It's very important in healthcare today. Hugely important in terms of, so everyone forced it. Oh, it's expensive robot. All oh, this is too much, too expensive, and so forth. So we looked at all kinds of different uh, uh, averages, looked at weighted averages in, uh, of the various possible treatments with TORS and without TORS. And um, basically we looked at transoral surgery alone, total chemo radiation alone, and weighted average of each. So just TORS alone is about 19,000 versus chemo radiation at 52,000. If you weighted the average of any TORS that includes chemo radiation to some extent or chemo radiation alone, TORS as 46 versus 50, that's a 9% cheaper for Medicare at six months than chemotherapy and radiation. 9% cheaper. So it is a cost effective way in early data. This is preliminary. We're studying it now with a Wharton business professor as we speak to, to see if that goes forward. So uh, annually, if you look at some rough cases, that's $29 million annually if we apply TORS versus the standard therapies that we could say. So in summary, TORS reduces morbidity rel relative to open surgery. Compared to chemo radiation, improved swallowing function, less peg dependence compared to anything published in the literature. Essentially 0% of it performed with our radiation strategy. That's classic, but just you know refined with TORS. Less morbidity and mouth pain stiffness potential. Potential for improved survival, because now we can add chemotherapy and radiation in the right doses if we need it, but not destructive. And there's a healthcare cost benefit. So I went back to this great study. This was a slide before when we were starting out. We had the questions, is this a paradigm shift in head and neck skull based surgery? No questions anymore. It is. TORS may know it has eliminated much of the significant morbidity with classic open procedures. And it will go where some of the other present techniques have yet to go. And this is a whole other talk for the future on where it's going. I'll leave it with this quote back in 2005. Robotic surgery is here to stay. Over the next 10 years, I gave this at the COSM presentation and, you know, with everyone laughing. Over the next 10 years, robotic technology will change the face of how we perform head, neck, sinus, neurologic, and skull-based surgery. Um, and we're almost over the hump. We're, we're basically right at the hump of March 11. Some conservatives will start going on. Skeptics are still claiming they want that level one data evidence um, to do that, and we're looking. So I'll end you with a quote. This is from Space Odyssey, different Odyssey, um, by Arthur C. Clarke's Three Laws. I didn't write this, so don't, no, please no one take any offenses if it, if it may apply to anybody's thoughts. Or, or it's not meant to be age discriminatory either, but it says when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is probably wrong. Um, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And finally, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that's, that's from 2001 Space Odyssey with both, both Weinstein and I likes. So we found that. So, Basically, TORS, it's an added value. Some people say it's just a toy. We believe, no, it's not a toy, not just a little robot. It is a tremendous added value to our patients and to the care of our patients. And I'll leave with a quote from our government, NASA. Man is the lowest, quote, lowest cost, 150-pound, nonlinear, all-purpose robot that can be mass-produced by unskilled labor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Mal, this was stimulating and exciting. Uh, we hope we don't have to come visit you. I hope you don't have to visit me as well. So, uh, is a, a question. Is anything lost? Would you rather operate with your hands or with a robot? I mean, do you lose something Tactile. remote? Tactile. It's a great question. The criticisms, many early on were that you don't have feel, you don't have official tactile feedback in your operating, so that sounds like it's going to be dangerous. What we found early on is that you don't have true tactile feedback in our classic sense, but you, the instrumentation has natural resistance when it comes up against the structure. You can feel that resistance, you can see that resistance, and part of something we found, and we're probably going to publish it at some point and, and, and figure out how to publish it, is we found the power of our eyes, and what we realized is our eyes are almost better than our hands. 
When we're looking at three dimensions in a closed view right up by the tumor, we can see tension, we can see tissue planes, we can see movement, we can see resistance, and it's amazing how much your eyes can see through those optics that give feedback back to your hands. And so you, we don't know that we can't feel anything. The only time you know is when your instrument goes out of the field, you have to stop because you, because you don't know where it is. So you stop and your assistant or you help and you may be adjusted back in. Occasionally it may wander out because you, you don't know where it is. But when you're watching, you have no, you don't even notice you don't have feel. It's only if you lose the instrument and that, and that comes up. Yes? I have a couple of questions. One is, are there still tumors that you can't reach? This, in other words, that you still have to do the old radical? There are still tumors you can't reach or maybe too big or too invasive for that. So you either have to do the radical surgery or radical chemo radiation or some combination thereof. More and more tumors, though, are, be, are, are, are in this category. As a matter of fact, the majority of tumors in the head and neck region that, w that we would look at, they might be advanced because of the lymph node status, but they're usually caught early enough that they can be applicable to our torch. So it's really the, the spread, the local spread called the lymph node metastasis that pushes that advanced stage more commonly.